My name is Spatniko, I'm an artist, I'm also a musician, designer, and I'm currently based in Boston, where I am an uh, assistant professor at MIT Media Lab, and I just started a new research group called Design Fictions, which I'm going to talk a little bit today. So, if you go to spatniko.com, you're going to see all the jumble of all the different works and things I do. I do too many things. But um, I think if you visit the website, you get a good idea. Is um, Basically, like what I do is um, I, design, uh, I design things that are kind of sometimes slightly controversial. <laughs> I design for debate, but then I write a story around this designed object. And I write a song about it. I make a video about it, and I post that video on YouTube or Vimeo to get, you know, to even, you know, spread out this debate further than just inside a museum or symposium. You know, if you design for debate, I want the debate to happen all over, and that includes YouTube comments, Facebook comments, Twitter feeds. So I'm a very, I work a lot with social media. So I am part of the RCA Design Interactions Mafia. Do, do you know this course, RCA Design Interactions? How many of you guys know this course? <laughs> yeah, okay. We, we are like a mafia network <laughs> around the world. And um, I was a student at RCA Design Interactions, and I studied with Professor Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, who are really like writing a lot about speculative design and critical design. So my work has a big influence of um, their ideas. So designing for debate. So when people think the word design, I think a lot of people imagine like designing a bottle that's easier to drink or designing a beautiful looking iPhone or you know, designing something functional. So I think design has a lot of association with problem solving, designing to solve problems. But in Design for Debate, we're interested in designing to ask questions, not solving problems. We design to ask questions about the world we live in. We design to ask questions about what the world could be, what the future could be. And I use the word could, not should, because it's not a moralistic thing, you know? It's not like, we have to do this, we have to stop this. It's more about opening up a space for questioning, thinking, debating, and really thinking, like, what, what future do I want? What future do I not want? And the next thing um, I'm interested in as an artist is the idea of the new pop. And I think the word popular has a bad, uh, I don't know, it got a bad name, popular. And I think that's because, you know, when you hear the word popular, you hear something like commercial. Popular is uncritical. Popular is unchallenging. You know, Paris Hilton, Justin Bieber kind of ideas. And that's understandable because, you know, everything that used to be popular if you think about the media, you know, TV, magazine, newspaper, these media, 20 years ago, they were accessible to very few people. So it's, yeah, likely that something popular is also something commercial and also something easily acceptable. But now, you know, obviously the social media has changed everything. Everyone has access to the media. So, you know, an idea that's not commercial the idea that's very challenging, controversial, they still you know, have a chance to be popular at the moment. So that's what I'm really interested in as Sputnik Girl. So as Sputnik Girl, I make pop music video, I appear in fashion magazines, and you know, Vogue Japan gave me like Woman of the Year last year. So I work a lot with a popular culture, but I'm very, very interested in getting uh, very uh, controversial issues, challenging issues uh, out in this popular 
uh, culture because if you design for debate, it's a pity if that de debate happens only in a museum, only in the, you know, the small circle. You know, if you want to change the world, if you want to get more people to think about an issue, then why don't we, why don't we get this debate more open and popular? Why don't we use this new social media that's available to us? So that's my second uh, key idea I have behind my works. So that's enough with the ideas part. So I'm going to show you my projects because um, some of you might have not seen. So this is the menstruation machine Takashi's take. How many of you have seen this before? Okay, quite a lot. In, okay. okay, so menstruation machine Takashi's take is a machine that allows men to experience the five-day process of menstruation. So how does this work? So on the menstruation machine, at the abdomen, there are these electrodes that give this dull sensation of pain on the stomach. And behind, there's 80 milliliters of blood that could be stored at the back. So 80 milliliters, that's, this is like 500. So it's like, you know, quite a lot less than this. I thought, we bleed a lot more, but actually, not too much. So, so this 80 milliliters of blood trickles down between the legs. So to build this machine, I worked with a professor called Jan Brosens at Imperial College in London. And he is this expert on menstruation. He knows everything about the pain, the hormonal changes, and like, you know, well, what, what happens with your body? He knows so much more about menstruation, much more than me. So talking with him, you know, I got a lot of ideas. And because I studied mathematics and computer science in undergraduate, I had sort of very basic engineering skills to, you know, in a very DIY way, I created this machine by hacking um, different uh, electronics. So I made a machine that allows men to experience menstruation. That's great, but as Spontnico, I don't stop there. I want to think, who uses this machine? And what's the story behind this machine? So I created this fictional character, Takashi, who's a transvestite man, and he feels unsatisfied just dressing up as a woman through fashion and makeup. So he decides he wants to biologically dress up as a woman, you know, so get ex menstruation onto himself so that he can maybe truly understand what it feels like to be a woman. And maybe he could really join in with this real girl PMS talk. So he decides to build this menstruation machine. He wears it and starts to hang out with his female friend in Tokyo. And I wrote music, I created a video, and I'm gonna show you this video just now. And ap apologies for the squashed uh, image. There's a problem with the ratio. So you're going to see everything a little bit squashed. So if you squint your eyes like this way, maybe it's going to go back.
Thanks. So that was my, actually my graduation project from RCA, Design Interactions. And when I shot this video, put it on YouTube, the video went absolutely completely viral. It was blocked in Wired, Boing Boing, Gizmodo, all these tech, mag tech blogs. And there were explosion of debates happening in YouTube comments, Twitter co comments, Facebook feeds. And people were asking like questions like, can you design empathy? Can you design something that cross gender boundaries? Or there were questions like, why did this guy, Spotniko, wanted to experience menstruation in the you know, first, first thing. You know, I, don't, I don't understand this guy. There was a lot of confusion about whether I was a guy or a girl. There still is a bit of confusion. If you type in Spotniko in Japanese, the first thing that appears in Google search is like, man. <laughs> so <laughs> I think some people think I am both. But anyhow, so there, there were questions like from, uh, you know, can you design empathy to why did this guy think about it? Or like there would be another girl saying, hey, like if men understood what it feels to go through menstruation, maybe the world's going to be a better place. You know, maybe there's going to be world peace. But then there's also other discussion about menstruation is that actually like in 1960, when the contraceptive pills first came out, the doctors then knew how to stop menstruation altogether. Because by taking these contraceptive pills every day, you can reduce the number of menstruation to like once a year. You, know, you don't have to menstruate every month. But at the time, the doctors were scared of designing the contraceptive pills that way because already women were worried about the contraceptive pills and already there were opposition against religious groups about the contraceptive pills. So the doctors deliberately designed the pill that to, so that you take the pill three weeks and you have a rest one week. So you menstruate every month, even if you didn't have to. So that was 1960 and it's been more than 50 years and there's been so much technology happening. There's DNA, bioengineering, uh, humans on the moon, internet, Skype, but still most women bleed every single month in pain. And finally, uh, in 2007, Libril is a new pill that came out in the US. And Libril is a kind of pill that you take every day. So you only you know, menstruate once a year. You know, the menstruation times drastically decreases. But you know, how many of us knew that? You know, how many women knew about this pill? Like, how many of you guys knew that you could stop menstruation? I guess, yeah, very few, like, not many people know this. And you think, you know, you think technology and science progresses fairly for everyone, but actually the how technology and science progresses is really influenced by the religious background of the times, cultural background, societal thing of the time. And it's just by looking at technology through the window of menstruation, <laughs> you could talk on and on about so many different things. So actually, um, because this project went viral, a curator at Museum of Contemporary Art saw my work and invited me to show this in a museum three months after my graduation, next to like Matthew Barney and all these different big artists. And then the year after that, uh, Paola Antonelli, curator of uh, MoMA, New York MoMA, invited me to show uh, in Talk To Me exhibition MoMA. And MoMA even did a whole debate night based on this project in April. So, you know, four years after releasing this on YouTube, people are still talking about it, which I'm very excited about, happy about. So that's Menstruation Machine Project. And I think that's probably one of the most uh, well-known ones. I'm going to show you the new project that I worked on. It's called the Moonwalk Machine Selena's Step. So this project, I worked in collaboration with people from NASA. So NASA has an organization called University Space Research Association. And there are a bunch of people interested in uh, public outreach of NASA. And a woman called Jancy McPhee 
emailed me one day and said, you know, she's interested in getting more girls interested in space research, space science. And Sputniko, can you work with us to make a video or a project to get more girls interested in NASA? So I was like, yeah, like, why not? Let's work together. So she invited me to uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, and I met like astronauts, engineers, all these different people. And that's when I sort of came up with the idea of this moonwalk machine. So what is the moonwalk machine? So in 1969, when the first man landed on the surface of the moon, that giant leap for humankind, well, since then, it's been nearly 50 years, but only 12 people have walked on the surface of the moon. And all of them are white, macho American men. And you think the moon is a very open space, but you know, it's still a very closed, closed place. And obviously, because of space race, you know, it's uh, USSR and United States going against each other. And you know, obviously, it was a very closed place. Uh, section of people who could go to space. So I was talking with Jan C, like, isn't this a bit annoying, you know? And I think more different kinds of people f should be going to space, you know, more women in space, more different, you know, cultures in space, different races in space. So, and I, I was doing research and, uh, you know, NASA, they send a lot of rovers. So, on Mars, there's a Curiosity rover going around Mars. And they sometimes send a moon rover, like a rover that goes around the moon. So I said, as like an act of like, you know, a symbol, why don't we hack the tire of this moon rover so that as a tire goes across the surface of the moon, the tire has these gigantic high heel footprints on the tire? So as a moon rover goes across, it leaves these high heel footprints, girly footprints on the moon. <laughs> so, and Jancy was like, okay, that sounds pretty crazy, but that sounds kind of fun. And if you're actually gonna get a moon rover go up in space, it's gonna cost gazillions of dollars, but it's the idea that's important. Let's get high heel footprints on the moon. So we started making a prototype of this moon rover that's able to make these uh, footprints. And uh, I also created a fictional character called Selena, who is a teenage girl who loves the space and who really wants to go to the moon. And she has this secret crush on this superhero called Luna Girl. She's a bit like Sailor Moon. So she's a samurai girl fighting on the surface of the moon with these high heels. And Selena really, really wants to be this lunar girl. And if she can't go to the moon right now, she's going to create this moon rover with these high heel prints. And she's going to shoot it right up in the space. And this whole story and the video was inspired by, have you seen this? This is a summer holiday, pro a summer project of a 13-year-old girl in California. And she launched her Hello Kitty doll into space. If you Google like Hello Kitty in space, you're going to find this video on YouTube. It's amazing. So she loved you know, technology, science, engineering. So she went online, Googled search all the like, technology you needed to make a rocket. And she attached GoPro and launched her Hello Kitty into space. So, you know, this is a crazy thing, but it's happening now in real life. You know, why not? You know, maybe Selena could exist, this um, character. So I'm going to show you a video of this Selena's uh, adventure and uh, mission.
My name is Luna Girl. Do you remember me now? It's sweet vengeance for me, but a giant triumph over evil. And that means you! Da, 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 dance on the moon right there. Da, 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 dance like I just don't care. Baby, we'll be kicking it and so over you. Da, 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 dance on the moon right there. Da, 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 dance like I just don't care. Dance with me, your legacy. You see, baby, that's me. You see, baby, that's me. Dance with me, your legacy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Virgin. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that was a crazy, crazy project just finished last November. It was shown in Museum of Contemporary Art, and it's going to be shown in Brooklyn Museum in New York and uh, Istanbul Design Biennale as well this fall. So it's sort of touring at the moment. Anywhere in Barcelona who's interested, <laughs> let me know. I would love to show in Barcelona too. So because we don't have that much time, we have until, like, I only have five minutes. So I don't know whether I should make it a Q&A session. I, I talk about my next project. So what do you feel like? Shall I just move on? OK, I'll, I'll move on. And I'm not going to show you the entire video because I'm going to run out of time. So this is called Crowbot Jenny. And this is another, another character I created. She's a girl who feels uneasy about talking to other humans, you know. She can't make friends with other girls. She feels, okay, if, she, if I can't make friends with humans, why don't I try to make friends with these non-human species around me? And what about crows? So she created a crow-shaped robot. And if you press the buttons on the robot, you can make different crow languages, crow calls, and have a, like, a communication with crows. And I actually met with crow specialists, they exist, in uh, Cambridge University. They're called Professor Nikki Clayton and Nathan, Nathan Emery to make this crow bot. And they had this whole bunch of different crow calls, like, hello, or I'm hungry, or like, you know, help, come help me, I, I'm surrounded by enemies. And they gave me this different audio files and I installed them into this robot, and I started testing this robot in London parks. So that's a test. That's a real crow, and I'm talking to a real crow, and ah, 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 three times? That means hello in British crow speak. They're, they speak different languages in Britain, Japan, America. Crows speak different languages, apparently. I didn't know this. They're very smart. So I say hello, and in a while, you're going to see the real crow respond to me. So that's me. Did you hear that? <laughs> so, you think technology versus nature, you know, people have this idea technology is against nature, it's different, but this is like an idea of maybe technology could bring nature closer to us, you know, you could be hybrid with nature, closer to nature through tech. So. I wanted to investigate this idea. And anyhow, that, that's me talking, trying to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with a crow. And again, Sputnik Girl, I create the, the character, the story, and I write a song and make a music video. And I'm going to show you a very short one. So we have like one minute for Q&A. <laughs> so, so that's Jenny. I'm playing Jenny.
Maybe think of questions while you watch this. Okay, I'm gonna cut it short. <laughs> if you go to YouTube, crow about Jenny Sponica, you're gonna find the whole thing. <laughs> but I'm gonna have, do I have like two minutes of question? Yeah, so I, I have two minutes of Q&A. So any questions, please let me know. So thank you very much for listening, thank you. Arigato. <laughs> any, any questions? Uh, navigate humor in this work. Um, yes. Do you find that, because th these are all very beautiful and very serious things, um, do you find that the humor makes it more accessible? Um, or does it ever maybe trivialize the things you're exploring? It, it's always, um, that's a very question, a good question, because I often say there are four main forces on the internet. Was it four? Okay, let's see if it's four. <laughs> okay. So one is sex. And then the next one is like, unfortunately, hate. And then the last two is humor. And what's the other one? Cats. <laughs> humor and cats. So humor, cats, sex, and hate. And out of the four forces, I prefer cats and humor. You know, but these are very important forces if you want to spread, like, make something viral, spread like a circle. And I, I enjoy working with humor and cats. <laughs> but it's true that if you do it too much, it becomes a joke. So it's, I always tr experiment the borderline. Thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? You could ask me in person, or you could tweet me something, so. But anyone? We? No? You have another? Yeah, yeah, if you have another one. The last. Yeah, this is the last question. Yeah. How, how do you um, prefer to exhibit these when you're showing in, a, in gallery and museum spaces? Um, like, what elements get included? So, um, in the Museum of Contemporary Art for Moonwalk Machine, I had a huge um, set like the moon. I used two tons of sand. <laughs> there was a moon inside a big space, a machine, and a big projection. And I also put um, the sets I use in the video, because they're a very important part of the work, like the bed that she's working in. But it depends on the space. So that's because I had a huge space. So I, had, I showed everything. Uh, photography, video. So it's a mixed media. But sometimes I just show a video. And I consider the computer screen as a very important exhibition space because most people who know Sputniko, they've seen my work on YouTube, but not in real life. You know, I think more and more artists' work are just seen on the screen. So you have to kind of think, you know, about the screen as well. What's a photography that is easily shared, you know? And what's a video that's easily shared? So, but yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much. That's the last question, right? So thank you. Arigato. Thanks.